All right, we want to welcome everybody that is with us at Disciples United. We are so glad to be able to be together and uh, worship the Lord. There is, you know, I'm thankful for social media. I'm thankful for Zoom. Um, but y'all, there is nothing that can take the place of meeting together so that we can physically uh, fill a space with the praises of the Lord. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 84, verse 5. And um, as y'all know, my wife and I, after there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon uh, college campuses, and starting with Asbury, and it's interesting, it, it, many people think that it started at Asbury Seminary, uh, which is uh, for over 100 years has been a place where ministers have been trained. The outpouring really did not happen in the seminary. It happened at the college itself. Uh, liberal arts. But, uh, so my wife and I, since we had been praying for revival since we got saved back in the 70s, um, because we got saved in the Jesus movement, which was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our generation, that just planted an earnest desire for other people to have this encounter with Jesus that takes place when there is just a, such an outpouring of this Holy Spirit. And so when we heard about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in um, Asbury, Kentucky, we said, well, I'd like to go there. Well, we decided that we were just going to do that. And so um, we got in our car and we made the trip. Now, many other colleges, as soon as there was this outpouring in Asbury, they sent buses or cars and they visited Asbury and then they went back to their own college campuses and Lee University was one such college. They are a Church of God Pentecostal college. It's a liberal arts a university and they're in uh, Tennessee and they were kind of on the way getting up to Asbury and so we travel all the way up there and got to Lee University and we were able to uh, sit in on their um, a chapel services, and that itself was, um, Carol has already shared a little bit about it, but I'll, I'll give you my take. Uh, we went there and um, didn't really know what to expect. I mean, when you think of a revival outpouring, I mean, everybody has their own uh, kind of mindset on what revival is, but uh, I, we had to go looking for where where's everybody at because the campus looked pretty empty and so we searched and we finally found the chapel where people were gathered and so we uh, we went into the chapel and it was a beautiful chapel and there was it could probably seat maybe 250 people but um, I would say half of the people there were people uh, that were adults definitely not students and uh, they were adults anywhere from like middle age all the way up to uh, seniors like my wife and myself and we thought okay well where's where's all the students where are all the all the kids well uh we found out later that they were in class and after about an hour then the chapel began to fill up with students many things happened people would or we were all it was a very prayerful kind of atmosphere and people were praying and um then somebody would uh sing a song and everybody would join in the singing and and then uh, people would stand up and testify and and uh, so it was a very prayerful uh, type of atmosphere but the thing that that grabbed him was this one student stood up and said uh, we're not he was apparently in the first group that went to Asbury and they came back and and this is what he said he went to one of his uh, seminary professors and he said what is revival? That struck me. How would you not know what revival is? But they had no idea. And then it began to dawn on me. I mean, I look at the Browns revival that I was able to attend in the 2000s um, that happened in Pensacola, Florida. A massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit that, um, I mean, Millions, I think two million people from all over the world congregated uh, throughout the five years that it was uh, going on. 
And so I'm thinking, well, Brownsville just happened. But then I thought, 23 years ago. So these students at Lee University weren't even born yet. And so they had no idea what revival was. And then he said, well, we're not really calling this a revival outpouring. We're calling it a prayer vigil. Ha! And that's what struck me. Is the Lord is pouring out his Holy Spirit upon these college students and giving, creating within them a hunger, a desire for more of himself with an intent that it would bring them to a point where they will pray. Because see, when the Lord pours out his Holy Spirit, it's, it's, it's not just for those of us who are longing for another revival outpouring, but it's for those that know, have no conception of what revival is and why we need it so bad. And so he, the Lord is drawing them in because it's really going to be an outpouring upon them. But they have got to begin to pray for it just as we are praying for it. They've got to take ownership and begin to cry out with a, a longing heart. Well, after I sat in the service for um, probably uh, maybe two hours or so, we were there maybe two, three hours uh, before we got in the car and went back, went up to Asbury that was several more hours up the, up the road up in Kentucky. Uh, but while I was still at Uni Lee University, the Lord spoke to me and, and told me two words. Hopeful longing. Now what did the Lord mean? My hopeful longing. This is a picture right here of Asbury. This was the main chapel where at first uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out and then they, they had so many people coming in from other states and even Indonesia, New Zealand and people from all over the world started flooding in within just a couple of weeks time. But uh, they began to open up other chapels. They had many different chapels throughout the college campus and so they began to open them up and simulcast and so everybody could see what was happening in the main chapel. But um, so this is just one of the many, many pictures that, that you can find on the internet. But the Lord spoke to me, hopeful longing. Well, what, did, what did the Lord mean? And what are we to learn from this? Well, Psalm 84 verse 5 says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are are set on pilgrimage. Now, y'all may know what a pilgrimage is. It's when somebody, um, their hearts are being drawn to the Lord. And so they do what they feel that they need to do to, to answer the Lord's call. And so they'll go on like a spiritual pilgrimage to, to fulfill this longing. Well, in essence, I believe that the, the hopeful longing can be summed up with this. The Lord is telling us, very simply, that there's more. At the root of the meaning of hopeful longing, the Lord is telling us that there's more of Jesus to be revealed, ha! and thus more of Jesus to be received. You know, this was... Paul says, this, this really strikes me. Paul, who had uh, known the Lord, the, the gospel was preached to Paul by revelation. He didn't get it from the other apostles. The Lord took him and revealed everything that Paul taught. He received from the Lord himself by revelation. And Paul was so powerfully used by the Lord to spread the gospel. But near the end of his life, not at the very end, but he wrote a letter to the Philippians and he summed up his desire. And this is what he said. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ. Oh! Now, does that grab you like it grabs me? Yeah. I mean, he knows Jesus. He's walked with Jesus. He has suffered for Jesus. 
I mean, he has gone through shipwrecks. He has been beat to death. He has gone through all kinds of suffering, all kinds of trouble, had wonderful, glorious experience with the Lord. And then he says, I want to know Christ. Well, you say, well, well, you do. But no, he understood what this meant, hopeful longing. There's more. There's more to be given and there's more to be received. But this was not only Paul's longing for himself, but this was Paul's earnest desire for others. And that's what he spent his life doing, trying to accomplish, to have others experience more of Jesus. In Ephesians, listen to this. When he wrote to the Ephesians, he told them of this longing he had for other people. And he said, Ephesians 1, 17, he wrote, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Oh, so he's not only praying for himself to know Christ but so that others whom he birthed in the faith, who he has discipled, who he has fathered, he said, listen, I'm praying for you guys so that you can know Jesus more. So hopeful. Many in this generation have never experienced a revival outpouring. The, the last really well-known and really, really maybe nationwide affecting revival on pouring was Brownsville and at the same time Toronto. Toronto happening in Toronto, Canada and um, Brownsville happening in Pensacola, Florida. And so this generation really has never experienced, they may have experienced great services, they may have experienced local outpourings, but that's not a revival. A revival isn't localized. But, oh, many people, thousands may be getting saved, but that's not revival. It is when a whole community is gripped with the sense that God is present and he will not be ignored. Jesus becomes the topic of everybody's conversation. Not everybody's positive, but everybody's talking. It's like when Paul went and began to minister in Ephesus. Y'all, there, there's so much to be said about that. But do you realize that in his two years in Ephesus, the Bible says that the gospel was spread whoa, throughout all of Asia. Y'all, that's a God thing. His ministry in that city affected almost an entire continent. Whoa! What is that? That is a revival outpouring. But this generation um, hasn't experienced one. Y'all, I am thoroughly convinced that every generation needs their own revival outpouring. Things are done in a revival outpouring that don't happen in any other time. Hearts are gripped. A revelation of Jesus is given in massive and powerful ways. People's eyes are open. Yes, they have to make their choice. Not everybody gets saved in a revival, but at least everybody has this clear opportunity. And so hopeful. What were these students at Asbury? What were, what were they doing there? They were hopeful that this is the real deal. They'd experienced church, but they know that there's more. And that's what this outpouring is doing. It's creating them within them a sense that there is more. And so they're hopeful. And they're beginning to pray. 
What about longing? Well, that's more my wife and myself. We were born again in the Jesus movement, uh, which was a, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit coinciding parallel with the charismatic movement in the 1970s, and, and it just affected a whole generation, or really many generations, because not only the young people, but also many that were very much older, already in established, more traditional churches. But we saw the effects of a revival movement. And then as we continue to serve the Lord, we experienced uh, the Browns revival and, and saw how that affected such a, a, a wide amount of people. So we have a longing. So many of those that I saw at the Lee University were older and probably had themselves experienced revival outpourings in their past. Uh, some of them did mention it. But many of those who have experienced revival in the past are longing, as I and my wife are, longing for another revival outpouring. So a hopeful longing, there is more. Say that. There's more. There's more. But do you really believe that there is more? And if you do know that there's more, do you want it? When I'd eat at my grandmother's house, knowing that she has spent literally, whenever she asked people over for dinner, it wasn't just that she threw together some sandwiches. My grandmother would spend all day fixing a feast. And after she had served everything and um, you had finished your plate, I tell you, she's going to stand up and she's going to stand looking at the food and and expect you to do what? Take more. There's more. But do you want more? Whoa! Well, the Lord spoke to my daughter uh, a little ways back and said, you can have as much of Jesus as you want. Whoa! There's more. But whether you receive more, is really up to you. There is more. And for those that are hungry, the Lord is kind of like my grandmother. He's fixed to feast. But are you hungry for more? So a hopeful longing, what is it? A hopeful longing is an invitation by God to come and feast on Jesus. Glory! Hallelujah! So God, what is he doing? God is supernaturally. He is supernaturally creating within people a spiritual hunger. Some of the some don't even know it's Jesus. They just know that there's got to be more. There's got to be something more. And they're hungry. And they just need somebody to tell them his name is Jesus. John chapter 6 verse 44 we read, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. So did you know that you didn't even come to Jesus except because the Father hooked into your heart and began to draw you. When Jesus said that he was going to turn his disciples into fishermen, they were learning from the best. Jesus is the best fisherman of men. Now this spiritual hunger is God's way of drawing people to Jesus. But why does he draw people to Jesus? Because he wants them to feast on Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the living water. So we don't come brown bagging it to eat with Jesus. No, no, no. That's nothing but religiousness. 
We don't brown bag and bring our own lunch and say, Jesus, you want something to eat? No. Jesus says, no, I want to feed you. I want to feed you me. Glory. Psalm 34, verse 8, which we've already read. Taste, not, we haven't, haven't read that one. Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He doesn't make anything that's not good. And the feast that we have in Jesus is God's best. John chapter 6, verse 35, that Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So there you have it. The bread and the living water. Now, a hopeful longing will often lead to a spiritual pilgrimage, which is where we started out in Psalm 84, verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Now, if you looked at that verse in your Bible, um, there's going to be many different translations, but uh, some of them, uh, like the NIV, says pilgrimage. Um, others use different words. Some of them talk about a highway. And I think, well, how did they get a pilgrimage out of a highway? Or how did they get highway out of what does this mean? So I looked into the original languages and it literally means that blessed are those whose strength is in you whose highways in their heart. Blessed are those whose strength is in you who have a highway in their heart. Oh! What is the Lord saying? He has created in you with this hunger that he's put in you. He's drawing you to Jesus. And he's putting you a highway so that you can travel in a spiritual way, walking to get to where God wants you to be so that you can receive the more that he has for you so that you can Based on Jesus. There's a highway in your heart. Now this highway that God puts in your heart is going to lead you. My son, no! It's going to lead you into some different places. Some places that you're really going to be happy to go to. Other places that you're really not going to be so happy to be there. Some places that are like Spiritual mountains. Some are like spiritual valleys. And some are full of storms and suffering. But these are this is a highway that God has put in you to take you to Jesus. And Jesus is going to be with you all along the way, revealing to you things. There's going to be some things that he'll reveal to you, to you in these spiritual mountaintop experiences that you'll receive nowhere else. Oh! But there are some things that he will reveal to you in these valleys that you will not receive on the mountains. My son, no! And there will be some revelation of Jesus that you will receive in these storms that you won't receive anywhere else. And so you say you're hungry for Jesus, but, but we, we would just really rather cap out on the mountains. But the Lord says, if you want all that I have to give you, and if you want as much as you can receive, then you're going to have to follow this highway that I put in your heart so that I can take you where I want you to go. So let's talk about this a little bit more in depth. Your pilgrimage is going to lead to uh, spiritual mountains. Mark chapter 9 verse 2 is one such encounter. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. Oh, what an experience. 
And there we know that um, Moses came to talk to Jesus. Elijah came. And y'all, have you, I don't know if you've ever thought of this like I have, but how did the disciples know that it was Moses? How did they know that this was Elijah? Oh! Y'all, this was such a powerful revelation that they just had a spiritual knowing. God's revelation is just oozing in this whole experience. They see Jesus. They see Moses who, who stood for the law. They saw Elijah that stood for the prophets. But God was going to teach them something. What did Peter say? Lord, oh, this is great. Lord, you want us to build three tents? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And God speaks. And all of a sudden, Elijah's not there anymore. Moses isn't there anymore. Just Jesus. And God speaks. This is my son. Listen to him. Now see, Peter, he's born, raised Jewish. Oh no, well we've got the law, we've got the prophets, and Jesus, you're just kind of in the mix. And God is nipping that in the bud. He says, oh no, Jesus is all in all. All that you need is in my son, Jesus. So see, they received more than just a revelation of Jesus in his glory, but they began to see Jesus is, is not in addition to the law and the prophets. More, he is the originator. Everything that God does is flowing through Jesus. Moses answers to Jesus, not the reverse. Elijah was sent by Jesus. Not the reverse. They bowed to Jesus. And so that when the Father said, this is my son, you listen to him. Moses had his day. Elijah had his day. But it all is centered in Jesus. on Jesus. Doesn't the church need to hear that again? Yeah. Whoa! Glory! Jesus. Glory! Oh, may the Lord give the church such a mountaintop experience where they see that the answer is Jesus. Hallelujah! Amen. But then there is these valleys. Oh, yeah. You know, Peter really voiced what we want. Lord, can't we just build a tent and stay up here? This is good. This is great. Well, the Lord doesn't want us to camp out on the mountain because there's some lessons for us to learn in these spiritual valleys. I don't know if you've ever had a spiritual valley. I've had a few. And um, I couldn't get out of it fast enough. But there's no rushing God. You can pray. You don't pray yourself out of a spiritual valley. You just pray, God, give me grace to get through this. But if we're wise, we'll say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Well, David had many spiritual valleys. And he wrote about one in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. What does that tell us? That there was evil present surrounding him trying to engulf him. But he said, I won't fear any evil. Even though it's present, breathing down my neck, chopping at the bits to destroy me, I'll not fear it. Why? Because you are with me. What do we learn in the valleys? Something that we didn't learn on the mountains. Oh yeah, we'd say, oh yeah, Jesus was with me. Jesus was with me. 
I was with Jesus. But in the valley, you see, you really need him. You are desperate for him. See, here Peter, Lord, I'll build you a tent. Oh, Lord, I'll, I'll take care of you here on the mountain. Peter had a lot to learn, didn't he? But here in the valley, we see, Lord, I need you to take care of me. I need you to protect me. I am desperate for you. Well, David summed it up. He said, I'll fear no evil for you are with me. It's a good lesson to learn how desperately we need Jesus. And sometimes when we get out of the valley, we start, you know, taking control again and living our lives and doing our thing. And then the Lord says, you know, you're getting off track a little bit. And so he takes us back into a spiritual valley so that we really get desperate again. And we see, boy, I really desperately need But it's not all mountains, and it's certainly not all valleys. The Lord just deals with us in balance. So you never think that you've got it all pegged out, you know where the highways are. As soon as you think you know where the highway's taking you, let me tell you, the Lord is going to surprise you. Sometimes the highway takes you out of a spiritual valley, and you think, oh good, I've got a mountaintop coming. And all of a sudden, you're smack dab in the middle of a storm. Well, Isaiah 43, verse 2 and 3 really sums this up. And it says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Hallelujah! So what is he teaching us? He's not just with us when evil is chomping at the bits trying to destroy us, but no matter what life throws at us, the Lord is our Savior. So no matter where Jesus leads you, he is always going to do this. Without exception, he is going to invite you to eat, but not eat with him. You could say that, but a more appropriate way is he is going to invite you to eat of him. He is always and forever the bread of life and the living water. So what does he serve? He serves himself. Revelation 3.20, I love this verse. This is a verse that we often use in witnessing to people and trying to uh, invite them to come to Jesus. But really, this is Jesus um, inviting the church to come to himself. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in to him and will eat with him and he with me. So we see that Jesus is the hopeful longing. He is the one that we should be longing for. And I want to, um, this is such a thin line, but it needs to be said. Be careful that you don't turn your hopeful longing into an idol. Hmm. Whoa! What do I mean by that? Our spiritual pilgrimages that we were talking about, uh, blessed are those who strengthen us in you who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. In other words, I am on that highway for more of Jesus. 
Our spiritual pilgrimage will often involve spiritual experiences, some of them on the mountaintops, and we love those. But we cannot make those experiences our goal. We want the highways to take, well, I can't say we, I want those highways to take me from one experience to the other. Good experiences. I want from glory to glory, but see, glory can also be a revelation of the Lord in a valley where he is with me when I'm surrounded with darkness, that he is the light that I'm depending upon. It reminds me of the children of Israel that were being led by the Lord out of Egypt and they are taken into the desert. From the very beginning, what does the Lord make it very clear that he is leading the Israelites to come and do? Worship. He says to, to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship me. Well, why can't they worship in Egypt? No! There's something special that God wants to do in his people. And it is going to culminate with their response of worship, glory. That is one something uh, something uh, that my wife and I noticed when we went to the Asbury Outpouring. Y'all, there were lots of men there. I mean, a lot of men. Usually you see in prayer meetings a lot of women with maybe that have drugged their husbands with them. <laughs> but not here. Oh no, this thing was you know, equally dispersed. I mean, men everywhere worshiping, hungry for more of Jesus. And they feasted and they came back night after night after night because they were hungry for more of Jesus. Well, the Lord led the Israelites to Mount Sinai. Uh, got there pretty quickly after they uh, left Egypt. And from the very beginning, from the time that they left Egypt, it was full of supernatural experiences. But when they got to Mount Sinai, I mean, it was like the, the Lord just let loose of tremendous, powerful, supernatural, miraculous experiences. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 19. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke built up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him if we continued to read on we would find that the people were so afraid that they said Moses we can't take this uh, don't let God speak you, you listen and you talk Y'all, this would y'all we think, we can read that and we think, oh yeah, man, that is, I love to go through that. That is that is so powerful. Y'all, I'm telling you what, the Lord knows how to scare your socks off. But it was a powerful revelation of huh, his power, his glory, his honor, his majesty. And they saw the a glimpse into the more. The one that Moses said his name is I am. You can say I am more. Mm -hmm. Now once Moses went up to the mountain, which happened pretty immediately after this event, 
the Lord called Moses up to the mountain and Moses went up and uh, the people have just come out of a tremendous experience with God and what did they do they made their longing switch they began to long for a repeat of an experience. Whoa! They were, have you ever heard of people that were adrenaline junkies? They just loved the rush. They loved to pump the adrenaline. So they do these wild and crazy and dangerous things just to have an adrenaline rush. Well, there is this excitement in an experience with God. But the Israelites allowed that desire for an experience to become their idol. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 32. I'll read verse 1, then I'm going to skip down to verse 4 and read down to verse 6. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, because remember Moses had been called up to the mountain. He's been up there through, for a few weeks. And, and um, hey, man, things aren't as great as they were when you were gone. I mean, listen, y'all, there is still experiences taking place there is still the mountain is still smoking there's still a fire on the mountain that is present the the, oh, the glory cloud the lord was present in this glory cloud that overshadowed them at night with a pillar of fire and then uh, a cloud by day so the lord is still very present there's still experiences to be experienced but yet it's not that kick like they had when God came down on Mount Sinai when Moses was there that first day. So that's what they wanted. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, Come, let us make a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't even know what happened to him. Then he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a cast metal calf. And they said, this is your God, Israel. They weren't, don't, don't misunderstand this. They weren't saying this was another God. They were saying, this is the God whom you've been serving. This is the God who just spoke a few weeks ago. This is the I Am. Whoa! This is your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt. Well, who was that? That was the great I Am. That was Jesus. This is your God. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to thee. Now get this, just to show you that I am on track on this. Tomorrow will, shall be a feast to the Lord. Yahweh. So y'all, we're just going to keep on worshiping I am. We're going to have a great feast to I am. But what have they done? They have perverted everything because they have made their desire for uh, repeat, an experience. They're now seeking for experience. And y'all, that is going to get them into a big mess of trouble. So the next day they got up early and offered burnt offerings 
And they brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink. Ho! Oh! So they're feasting on the Lord. No. Because what does it lead to? It got up to engage in lewd behavior. They turned their hopeful longing for more of Jesus into a longing for just an experience. Now, are experiences bad? No, the Lord gives them. But this is where we get off track. When we start seeking after an experience instead of after the Lord himself. We need to be open to experiences. The Lord has a lot to give us. And he knows exactly where to give them. He knows how to give them. But he is the one that knows what to do. And so you don't go seeking experiences. Um, when I went to Asbury, I'll, I'll use myself. I, I went, I wanted an experience with Jesus. And I didn't have one like I wanted. So I was a little disappointed. Just being honest. But the Lord did speak to me hopeful longing and it just well it gave birth to this message but it also just gave me an understanding of a little bit of what the Lord is doing whoa but he didn't give me that experience that I was longing for so what do I do I just need to get my focus back on Jesus Amen. and just seek him and let the experience, I look at it this way. You know, Jesus, uh, when he gives us a feast, he doesn't start out with dessert usually. Dessert is the experience that we just, I love desserts. But he gives us bread that he says is spirit in life. And he gives us living water. And then... Sometimes he ends it with a great big dessert. But I don't sit down with him to say, oh no, I'll just skip to the third course. I want the dessert. No, we feed on Jesus. So feasting on Jesus, or feasting with Jesus, you feast with Jesus so that you can feast on Jesus. That is, needs to be your goal. Whoa! Glory! Masonda Coriste! Now listen carefully, please. We've already talked about the mountains, the valleys, the sufferings, the storms. Where you feast with Jesus is up to him. Be it mountain, valley, storm. That's up to him. But whether you feast with Jesus is up to you. Whoa! He's going to fix it. He's going to lead you to the place where the feast is going to be given. But whether you partake, that's not up to him. That's up to you. So listen, y'all. You don't want to go to the mountain and not feast on Jesus. That's, you might have a great experience, but if that's all you have is an experience and you're leaving the mountain without receiving that which you were taken to the mountain for. It wasn't just for an experience. It was to feast on. What would have happened if Peter, James, and John saw Jesus glorified and saw Moses and Elijah and didn't get the real purpose of it? This is my son. Listen to him. What would they have been talking about when they came down the mountain? I saw Moses. I saw Elijah. Instead of Jesus. Y'all, I'm telling you, Jesus is all we need. 
He is the sum total of everything that God is doing. He is the I am. Glory! So get what you're supposed to be getting. The experiences are great, but feast on Jesus. So how do you pursue a hopeful longing? You want more. What do you need to do? God is going to prepare a feast. He has prepared a feast in Jesus. It's going to be up to you to eat it. So what do you need to do to pursue this hopeful longing that you have? Three things, real quickly. First of all, you need to begin to worship. That's what God has drawn you to himself for. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, great verse, you need to memorize this one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Oh, y'all, it's just really all about worship. God has drawn us to himself. Listen, if y'all don't like to worship, you are really just going to hate heaven. <laughs> heaven is just full of what? Worship. Worship. But worship y'all in ways that we haven't hardly even scratched the surface. Hallelujah. So there is this worship that the Lord wants us to begin to tap into. And then there's the word, 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. As I've been telling you, you need to do more than just read the word. You need to study the word. When you're reading the word and the Lord just causes something to grab your attention, don't skip over it. Camp there. Allow the Spirit of God to begin to speak to you through that. Open up dictionaries. Research the words. Find out what this means. What is the context? What is the Lord trying to teach you through that? Until you do that, listen, y'all, I'm telling you, until you begin to study the word, you are going to be ill-equipped to be able to fulfill your mission. Listen, I tell you what, you're going to be talking to some people that are going to be able to wrap you into circles because they have been so taught and trained in deception. You better know the word. So you worship, you study the word, and then you work. John chapter nine verse uh, John chapter nine verse four. Jesus said to his disciples, "As long as it's day, we must do the works of Him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work." Jesus said, "I don't do anything except that which I see my Father doing, and that which the Father's told me to do." But Jesus was a busy man full of worship and prayer, full of the word. He was the word, but he studied the word. How do you think that Jesus knew that he was the Messiah? The word. The word! Can you imagine? This grabbed me the other day. I just thought, Jesus knew that he was the Messiah before he was 12, because when he was 12 and he went to the temple, he said, "This didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? I had to be in my father's house? So he already knew that God was his father. Can you imagine the day that Jesus is studying the, the Torah and the Spirit says, that's you. Whoa! Glory! Glory! What did that come out of? That came out of a life that was full of worship. A life that was dedicated to studying 
the word. Glory! And then Jesus, the, all of that found a free flow through him in touching other people's lives. Work. Let me ask you, we're going to close this. Is your, I believe that you have a hopeful longing. I believe that you, you know that there's more and, and you want more. But is your hopeful longing a person, Jesus, or is it an idol? You just want an experience. Y'all, I know what I'm talking about because I am uh, so geared for experience. It that just uh, that just. I love it. I love the experience. But I've walked with the Lord for over 50 years, and I'm just telling you, it's not all experience. And some of the experiences you would just rather not have. But the Lord has put a highway in your heart. And if you're, if you're only looking for the experiences, you're going to be so disappointed, and you can be so easily deceived. Can I share an experience, an experience that I did have where I really, because I was so experience-oriented, I was I had just gotten saved, I was uh, filled with the Spirit and loved the Lord zealously, and um, somebody got a hold of me and told me that they were a prophet of the Lord. I was just 16, and uh, they took me alone with a group of other people and and away from leadership that would have certainly have steered us away from all the, the stuff that was about to be poured out. And he began to uh, speak into our lives prophecies, but he started with this. The Father is upset with you. Oh, my God. I have upset the Father. Y'all, I was beside myself with concern. And he said, the Father is upset that you are spending more time with Jesus than with him. Y'all, I was, I was so concerned, so upset. And I, you know, what should I have done? I should have gotten up out of my seat rushed out of that room and gone and gotten the spiritual leader over that ministry. and said, Jim, you need to come in here. And that would snip that thing right in the bud. But I didn't. Because I was open to an experience. Y'all, that's bad. It got nothing but worse. Everybody in there, this prophet began to tell us who we were going to get married to and told me that I was going to marry this girl that was sitting beside me and she raped, she didn't want to get married to me. <laughs> and she raised, no! You know, it was awful. It was awful. It was, and it just set people into confusion. It just caused a mess. But why was that even able to thrive? Because we were looking for an experience instead of keeping our focus on Jesus. Listen, y'all, the Father's focus is upon who? Jesus. Jesus, always. The Spirit's focus is upon Jesus. Jesus. And so what do our what does our focus need to be? Jesus. Jesus. What does our message need to be? Jesus. Jesus. So is your hopeful longing a person, Jesus, or is that an idol? As long as it stays, Jesus. Whether you are fed the experiences that you want or not, you'll, you'll just say, Lord, you know what I need, but I just want you. Amen? Amen. 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 Stand together. Carol, could you start leading us in worship? Amen. Let's just put our focus on Jesus right now and let's worship him.
Think of all that he is. 